three. What is up? What is up? What is up? It's been a long time, and we are roughly around 320 days away. That's just a rough estimate, but around 320 days away from the 2023 NBA draft. And in this episode, find out who I believe are the top incoming freshman prospects in what is considered to be a loaded class that is also going to be one of the most unique classes in recent memory. Stay tuned. And you are listening to the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast, your daily NBA draft podcast. I am Rafael Barlow, the director of scouting for NBA Big Board and the founder of NBA Draft Junkies. I'm a credentialed media member. I have a Dallas Mavericks credential. I've traveled all over the world scouting and evaluating prospects. You can call me the one-stop shop for draft content. I scout, I write, I create videos. And of course, I drop podcasts covering the NBA draft. And it has been, it seems like it's been forever. After three weeks away, I am glad to be back behind the microphone. Shout out to the Locked On NBA Big Board crew, Richard Stamen, Leaf Tulane, and Sam Ferris. Shout out to those guys for holding it down for me while I was out for the birth of my son. And shout out to each and every one of you for making the Locked On NBA Big Board podcast your first listen of the day. And... Again, I'm happy to be back. It has been a crazy few weeks for me, and I'll just give you a brief update on my life changes. So I went to Las Vegas for the Summer League, and it was on a Thursday. So Summer League, uh, the opening day was on Thursday. So I wanted to see Paolo Bancaro and Jabari Smith play, just go face-to-face or, or heads up. And on my way out to the airport, I was packing, and my wife got a voicemail saying i was from the doctor's office saying that they were going to have to deliver my son young Raphael, young Raph as we call him on july 13th which was the following wednesday and um i, I guess there was some specific reason why they felt that it was it was the need to deliver him at 36 weeks instead of 40 so Imagine I'm on my way to Las Vegas. I'm, I'm, I'm excited about Summer League. I, I know that the birth is coming up soon, but I, I really wasn't expecting to to get that call. So while I was in Vegas, I had a great time, I had a chance to catch up and meet with a lot of different people, watch good basketball. But I had to cut the trip short. And my main focus was like, when I land, I'm about to be a dad in a couple of days. So I ended up getting back from Vegas on Monday. And then on Wednesday, July 13th, my life changed forever as um, the birth of my my son, who, I, man, I really hope that we have the same interests. I hope that he can one day take over for me or we can go on scouting trips together. But anyway, I've been out because, um, you know, just adjusting to a new schedule. Anyone that has had a newborn knows that sleep is, is tough and Ended up having to be in the hospital a couple of times. My wife had, um, I mean, she had some some challenges after the birth of the child. So that was another reason why I was out a little bit longer than expected. But everything is good. Wife is doing great. Baby's doing fine. And uh, I'm not sleeping. I'm not, not getting a lot of sleep. But overall, man, the experience has been great. Um, I feel like I've missed out on so many different podcasts. I didn't get a chance to really do a recap of Summer League and talk about what I saw there because I don't think I, I did any episodes after after I, I arrived in Las Vegas. So I wrote some articles about it. It's on NBABigBoard.com. I wrote a few articles, which is a lot easier to write articles when you're in the hospital room as opposed to trying to bring your podcast equipment and have it all set up. But overall, man, it's, it's just been a great, great great experience but today's episode i want to talk to you about some of the top freshman players in the 2023 nba draft class now this freshman class is going i shouldn't say this freshman class this nba draft class is going to be very interesting because there is a strong possibility a strong possibility that four of the top five picks or maybe even the first four picks and next year's draft could be playing outside of college basketball. You got Victor Wimbayama, who's in France. You have Scoot Henderson, who's playing for the G League Ignite. And then you got the two super crazy uber athletic Thompson twins who are playing in the Overtime Elite League, which 
I think it's going to be a big year for Overtime Elite. Last year, they didn't have anyone drafted when they were expected to possibly have two. Maybe one for sure, but two guys. But this year, I mean, they could really, really kind of separate themselves from, you know, from the pack or, or, or address some of the concerns about the league if they can get the two twins, Amen and Asur. Amen. Asur. Thompson. If they can get those guys selected in the top five, I mean, that would just be great, especially considering it's their second year. But the focus is on the top five freshmen. Maybe I'll have time to get into a little bit more, but some of the top freshman prospects entering college basketball, their incoming freshmen. And I did some research. We have not had a non-freshman go number one since Blake Griffin in 2009. Now, this is the year that it's expected to change. I personally don't see a scenario where Scoot, and Victor are moved out of the top two spots. I mean, a freshman would have to have like this incredible, I don't even want to say a Carmelo Anthony type run because even with Carmelo's great freshman year, he still didn't end up being the number one pick. So let's, let's get right into it. The number one freshman on my list, I'm going against the grain here. And if you know me, you know, going against the grain is something that I do often. But my number one freshman is Keontae George, a 6'4 combo guard who will be playing at Baylor. Now, I'm very familiar with George's game, and maybe I'm a little bit biased, but I live in Dallas, and I've had a chance to watch him play over, you know, the last few years. I saw him play in high school when he was at um, high school, and then I saw him play pickup. I've seen him play AU ball, and I think George is a special talent. He has this high upside as his microwave score he is an aggressive score and he just exudes confidence he's one of those guys where like if you didn't know any names and you just went to a gym and you had to guess which one was the best player by watching warm-ups george is one of the guys that i feel like you could pick him out just the way he carries himself i think that he has the potential to be a three level score in the in the NBA which means he can get to the back he can get to the basket he can shoot the pull up jumper and shoot from 3 but also think that he has a chance to be a four level score because his shooting stroke is effortless he has one of the prettiest most picturesque shooting strokes that I've seen in recent memory he's also a good athlete has a good combination of burst and pace he is more athletic than he plays he's one of these guys that he's very athletic but his game isn't tailored or based off of his athleticism so if you haven't watched him play you may think oh he's he's a good athlete he's fluid but you may not realize how explosive he is because he just has like this this excellent pace to his game i'm not the best at comparisons but i have seen some people compare him to bradley bill i don't think that's a bad comparison i've seen some people compare him to Jaden hardy um that is you know not not a bad comparison either because hardy despite not having the greatest year was a projected top five pick one of the things i like most about george is his ability to change gears and speed he can create off the dribble he has the offensive creativity that i love my favorite part of his game is his ability to get to his sweet spots and stop and pop and shoot the mid-range jumper i've also seen someone say that the way he shoots the the mid-range and gets to his spots and elevates over guys is kind of similar to CJ McCollum, which is also a a, a good comparison in my opinion. I mean, the elevation on the jumper is a little bit Ray Allen-like. I mean, you know, Ray jumped, it seemed like, to his peak on every jumper. Stephon Marbury is another guy that I felt like really elevated on his jumper, and George has that ability. Again, an advanced ball handler, knows how to create space. The big key for George is position. He's 6'4", So he's kind of like a tweener in a sense. I think right now he's more so of a natural too, but he has shown some flashes of being able to play on ball. And I was very encouraged by his performance at the Global Jam, which was in Toronto a couple weeks ago. The Global Jam was like a a tournament that featured four teams from different parts of the world. It was an under-23 tournament, so a few of the players were a little bit older. I guess maybe similar to to college basketball in a sense because guys are – even though the players entering the draft are getting younger, I feel like the players that are playing college basketball are, are getting older with the extra years of eligibility and the, the grad transfer rules. So this was a, a league. It was a tournament again, 23 and under. And I thought George was, was the best player there. He had a couple 30-point games, had one game where he exploded for 
37 points, had a 32-point game. Had a, a few games in between there where he struggled a little bit with his efficiency. But what I was really encouraged about was he played a little bit of point guard, saw him playing in, out of ball screens. And although the assist turnover ratio was not great, he showed some flashes and some glimpses of court vision and being able to make some high-level reads. But again, he's wired to score. He's thinking score first. But if he can show progression as a a playmaker and being able to balance out looking for his own shot and getting other guys involved then he could really really be special in the NBA and that could potentially put him as a a top five pick because again he has the scoring instincts plays through contact he knows how to get to the foul line but one of the things I really like about him that I think makes him a little bit different than a lot of prospects that play a similar position is not only is he comfortable playing on and off the ball, but he can be used coming off pin downs and off the ball motion plays. You can run down screens, get him open. You can play him strictly as like a, a two, or you can put him in pick and roll where he can, again, get to the rack, shoot the mid range, pull up and also knock down open threes. And I didn't mention this, but I have a video that I posted on Twitter. But one of the things I like is his ability to shoot threes off the dribble. It's like very Damian Lillard-esque in a sense. So obviously I've raised the bar high because I've mentioned Bradley Bill. I've mentioned CJ McCollum. I mentioned Dame Lillard. So I'm very, very high on Keontae George. And I think that he has a very, very strong chance of being a top five pick in June's draft. All right. When we return, I'll talk about Nick Smith. Nick Smith is arguably the biggest competitor for George and most people have Nick Smith ahead of George but I talk about Nick Smith who could be the first college player selected in the draft if it's not Keontae George but first I want to talk to you about Built Bar now I'm wondering if you've tried the Built Bar Puffs now if you have not tried the Puffs you are depriving yourself of one of life's greatest joys and guess what there is a new flavor a new flavor is delicious and it is cookie dough it is covered in chocolate that's right built bar has done it again let me introduce you to the new favorite cookie dough chunk puffs the cookie dough chunk puffs have a light and chewy texture with real cookie dough chunks and of course if you know built bar they're covered with 100 percent chocolate so all the joys of eating cookie dough without the hassle of making it on top of that it is healthy Cookie dough chunk puffs are only 160 calories and they have a whopping 15 grams of protein in them. So run to built.com to snag a box for you and the family. It will be the perfect treat or you can find a really good hiding place and just hoard them for yourself. Now that I have a son and I know eventually he's going to want to eat snacks and my favorite snacks, I'm going to have to find a hiding spot, but I got a few weeks before, well, not a few weeks, a few months, maybe even a year or so before I have to get to that point. But the Built Bars are something that I definitely want to share with him, but also want to hide. But like all Built Bars, the new cookie dough chunk puff is covered with 100% real chocolate. That means they are healthy and tasty. Chocolate covered cookie dough with a light, fluffy texture. So good. <laughs> it's so good. I'm going to guarantee that you're going to love the new cookie dough chunk puff. And what's great about the built bars is that they're made with collagen protein, which your body absorbs more efficiently and provides tons of health benefits. So eat something that tastes good and is good for you. And like I said, you're going to love the cookie dough chunk puff, whether you need a snack for your workout or a late night treat or just to grab a quick bite. Built is the perfect protein bar and they taste better than a candy bar so you can ditch the calories the fat and the sugar grab yourself a built bar go to built.com use the promo code locked 15 and you'll get 15 percent off your order use the promo code locked 15 and you will get 15 percent off your order at built.com all right once again shout out to each and every person that has made the locked on nba big board podcast your first listen of the day i appreciate it i know my crew appreciates it the next player that I want to talk to you about is Nick Smith, who a lot of people have as the top NCAA prospect in the 2023 draft. Nick Smith is a player that I had a chance to watch. I want to say it was in 2020. There was like a Wooten McDonald's um, showcase tournament that was that was in Dallas. And Nick Smith was 
coming into the camp, I, I put it like this, coming into the camp, I thought he was one of, you know, one of a handful of guys that I was keeping my eye on. But by the end of the camp, it was without a doubt that he was the best player there. And I think that put himself in, that put him in position to where he has risen up recruiting ranks and ended up being a top three pick, depending on whichever scouting service that you prefer. But Nick Smith is the real deal, kind of like Keontae George, a, a combo guard. I think Nick has a little bit more natural point guard instincts, but he has great size, 6'5". Here he has a reported 6'9 wingspan, has broad shoulders. I think he has a good frame that can fill out. He'll, he'll definitely need to put on some weight, but he is smooth. I mean, like this, just this smooth athlete with excellent fluidity, plays with good pace, not a guy that you can really speed up. It just seems to 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 be in control, and he also has another skill set that I really like. He changes speeds off the dribble. He's shifty. He he can create off the bounce, and you know I love offensive creativity, and I love guards that can get you a bucket. You know that's why I was so high on Van Carroll coming into the draft, even though he's not a guard, even though he's has the guard skills. But I love guys that can get you a bucket and create their own shot. And one of the things that Nick Smith has that's really advanced is he has excellent touch on his floater. He has the soft touch finish package that I think every guard should have because you're not always going to be able to get all the way to the rack. You need to have, you know, like I said, a soft touch floater that you can get up over the Rudy Gobert's of the world because it's tough to finish on him. And Nick Smith has that. Now, he can be a little bit too reliant on his floater. I would like to see him get to the all the way to the basket a little bit more, but the floater's there. He does have the mid-range pull-up, and one one thing that he does really well is he draws fouls, and that's something that can be a little bit difficult for people to master because he's one of those guys, like, is he, if he's having an off-shooting night, let's say the jumper isn't falling and he can't get to the rack, he can still contribute in, in the scoring column by getting to the free throw line. Now, some of the concerns... And it's weird because, like, I when I watch film on guys, I you know write down my notes, and then sometimes I go and look at what other people are saying and, and see if like I totally agree with them or or I just feel like they are totally off. And one of the things I've seen about Nick Smith, I've seen multiple people say that he is a great athlete, an elite athlete, and in my opinion, I don't think he is an elite athlete. He's a very good athlete. I, I mean, fluidity and and. And all of that is part of athleticism. But no, he doesn't have like your your Jaden Ivey burst or great first step or crazy vertical pop. But I do think he is a good athlete. But another concern I have is, I kind of mentioned it a few seconds ago, is his finishing at the rim. He prefers the floater as opposed to getting all the way to the basket. I'm kind of nitpicking here, but I would love to see him get all the way to the basket. And he does have a tendency to drive without a plan. But Nick Smith is going to be one of the most talked about freshmen this upcoming season. And he's playing in arguably the best backcourt in college basketball. He'll be sharing the backcourt with Anthony Black, who was also a McDonald's All-American and someone that I'm sure you're going to hear me talk about a lot. Black is a big point guard freshman. So it, it'd be interesting. I mean, I imagine both of them are going to play on and off the ball and the talent wise I mean like I said I think this is the best backcourt in the nation but I'm curious to see how they will complement each other because in some ways they they are a little bit similar and I think that they're best both uh, both of them are best with the ball in their hands and so we'll see how they will share the ball but Nick Smith who many people think will be the top freshman and, and maybe even the top college prospect in college basketball all right the next player that i want to talk about is cam whitmore and i became a big cam whitmore fan after watching him at the fiba under 18s and where, where he took home mvb honors had 30 points 12 rebounds in the championship game he is on his way to villanova 6 7 225 very very explosive athlete has an nba ready body he does kind of remind me as far as like the athleticism and the body of the guy that I don't want to mention his name. He's in a little bit of trouble right now. Uh, he was expected to get a max contract or max offer, but, you know, 
has some legal issues right now. But I do think there are some similarities between Cam Whitmore and that player that played for the Charlotte Hornets last year. Now, one of the things that I really, really enjoy about watching Whitmore on film is the energy, the motor, the chip on his shoulder, everything that he brings to the table. I think at the very, very minimal, he could be like your your energy guy that can just affect games by just being, I don't know, more athletic and playing harder than everyone else. But he does have some skills. He can create his own shot. I think that he is going to develop into a really, really good shooter. The concern, though, is he's a really poor free throw shooter. <laughs> like he's a it's weird because he's such a promising shooter from deep that you would think that he would be a a much better free throw shooter. Kind of reminds me in the sense of um, Jemias Ramsey a couple years ago. I kind of drew a blank there. Jemias Ramsey was a player that I saw in, in high school here in the Dallas area. I didn't think he was a very good shooter in high school. And then at Texas Tech, he was like a lights out shooter, but he wasn't a good free throw shooter. And Cam Whitmore has a little bit of that in his game, but I think Whitmore is is obviously a, a better prospect. But he is someone that I think can play the three, can play the four. Great rebounder, especially on the offensive glass. Tough, competitive, chip on his shoulder. He's rising up different boards. He wasn't, I mean, I don't think he was like a top 10 recruit until at to the very end of the season. He does have a tendency to play out of control, but I think at Villanova, which even though Jay Wright is gone, I think they'll teach him to, to play the, the right way. Not saying he plays the wrong way, but they'll I think they'll be able to address some of his weaknesses or areas of concern. So Cam Whitmore is another player that I think has a chance to crack the top five. All right, when we return, I'll talk about a couple of centers. Even though some people feel like centers don't have value, you can get them later on in the draft. But I'll talk about a couple centers that I think could potentially best case scenario crack the top five stay tuned all right once again you're listening to the locked on nba big board podcast i am your host rafael barlow and now i want to talk to you about Derek lively who was on his way to duke lively for the most part is the top prospect coming out of high school he was the number one player in a lot of different recruiting classes and he is a player that reminds me of tyson chandler in a sense maybe it's I know physically he reminds me of Tyson Chandler. Let's just say that. Um, He's skilled. He has stretch five potential. And the reason I I say Tyson Chandler is because when Tyson Chandler was in high school, he was, I think for the most part, he was the number one player in his class. Tyson Chandler, maybe I think at the last minute, Kwame Brown or Eddie Curry were kind of picking up steam. But Tyson Chandler was a phenomenal high school player. He was... I'm trying to think of the best way to word it. He didn't live up to his offensive potential in the NBA, I should say. I personally feel like he settled for a role as a vertical lob threat and a defender. Wow. In high school, he showed flashes of being able to shoot. He just had more offensive games than he was able to showcase. Now, it's it happens all the time, but he had a great career. I feel like he played like... I don't know, 15 years or something like that. One defensive player of the year, won a championship. Lively reminds me of Tyson Chandler. I think he can have a similar Chandler-type impact throughout his NBA career on the defensive end. But if he um, if he continues to progress as a shooter, then I think he could possibly, best case scenario, be like a Tyson Chandler-type with stretch five potential, he's going to be a vertical lob threat. He does have gravity as a role man. He's a good athlete. He can run the floor. I think he has a pretty good motor, solid touch around the rim. He'll, he'll rebound. He'll block shots. He is an elite shot blocker. He is a really good shot blocker. What's crazy is he played on the same AU team as Jalen Duran. Like, like, I mean, like we're getting to the point where high school teams are having multiple NBA big men on the same floor. Like, how do you? I mean, they didn't win in the Peach Jam uh, last summer, but it, I, you see why. <laughs> you know, they had those two guys on on the team. Duran was a lottery pick. Derek Lively, many considered the top player. And even though Duran was supposed to be in this class, they had two of the top five players in the class on the same team, even though they played similar positions. So, um, Lively is a guy that I I'm curious to see what. What he does at, at at Duke, you know, this is a transition year for Duke. Now, my concerns about Lively, 
is even though I think that he is very skilled, I do think he settles too much and floats on the perimeter a little bit too much for me. Doesn't really get good low post position. He's easily pushed out the paint. Um, I, I feel like sometimes he avoids physicality, but I think he's skilled. I mean, I don't think he, he you're going to need him to be a guy that you dump the ball to on the block and, and get buckets. I don't think that would be his role. But I do think that if he can develop into a reliable shooter, then that will you know, make him pretty good on the offensive end because he's going to be a vertical lob threat role, man. But if he can be an inside, outside, pick and roll, pick and pop guy that defends at a high level, then he could be a team center of the future, which, you know, a lot of teams aren't really high on drafting centers anyway. A lot of people feel like centers can be had at the back end of the lottery. They wouldn't, you know, waste the lottery pick on them. And if so, then another player that could be affected by that, but I think will be a lottery pick, is Khalil Ware. He is a seven-footer on his way to Oregon. Played with Nick Smith in, uh, in, in Arkansas. And you got to think, like, Arkansas has such a dominant recruiting class, but they let Khalil Ware get out the state. But anyway, Ware is, a, again, like I said, seven-footer, excellent size and length, has a massive wingspan, good touch around the rim. He will be your, your vertical lob threat. He's agile. I think he has a strong lower frame. I, I do think that he is going to bulk up and be able to put on weight, and that has very little impact on his game. Strong finisher around the rim. Loves to dunk everything. He's active. Quick second jump. He's a good rebounder. He is not afraid of contact. So one of the strengths I have for Ware is something that I think could be an area of concern for Lively. Uh, where I think has good hands, crashes the offensive glass, runs the floor. I think that he is going to be dynamite for Oregon this year. As far as areas of concern, I think he needs to improve his left hand. Doesn't really have any post moves. Or he has one move that he uses all the time. Doesn't really have any counter, counter moves. And whether you think this is a concern or not, um, he just... As of right now, I don't really see the shooting range. He may have some potential to space the floor. And I know like for a modern big, some feel like you either have to be a a defensive anchor or stretch the floor to, to really be effective. And many people feel like if you're not one of the two, then it's going to be hard for you to not necessarily be a starting center, but, you know, be like an all-star caliber center. So... I don't see the shooting range right now, but of course, he, he can add that to his game. And then another concern that I have is that his decision making. He's not really a good passer at this point, but again, that is kind of nitpicking there. So I've covered Keontae George, I've covered Cam Whitmore, I've covered Nick Smith, Khalil Ware, and Derek Lively. Those are five of, at least in my opinion, the top impact freshmen for the 2023 NBA draft. I have some more. I mean, obviously, I didn't mention Derek Whitehead. I, I briefly mentioned Anthony Black. There's Kaysen Wallace. There's Dylan Mitchell. I mean, I, I think this is going to be a strong class. I will talk about them on the next episode. But before I go, I wanted to thank each and every person, again, for making the Locked On NBA Draft your first listen of the day. Now, for your second listen, get up to date on the latest news and rumors in the NBA. In just 30 minutes every day with the Locked On NBA podcast. The Locked On NBA podcast is your daily NBA update in just 30 minutes. Once again, I am Rafael Barlow back from a three-week absence due to the birth of my son. I am glad to be back, and I'll be back later on this week to finish out my top incoming freshman. And I am out.